Hello, I'm Gary Dillon. I'm a board certified pediatric cardiologist and a current clinical fellow in critical care medicine at the Department of Anesthesiology, Critical Care and Pain Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital at the Harvard Medical School. And today we'll be discussing Wolf Parkinson White, referred to as WPW syndrome, and pearls for the anesthesiologist and intensivist. I have no disclosures for this presentation. This lecture is purely for educational purposes, and the information provided in this lecture should not be used as a replacement for the expertise advice of cardiology, anesthesiology, and intensive care consultations. The objectives for this talk will be threefold. We will discuss WPW syndrome, review electrocardiogram examples of this syndrome, and also provide a brief review of perioperative considerations in patients with Wolf-Parkinson-White. Wolf-Parkinson-White is due to the anatomic presence of an accessory conduction pathway that allows for re-entrant SVT. This accessory pathway represents an abnormal fibromuscular connection into the ventricular myocardium and remains after incomplete atrioventricular separation. The prevalence of the syndrome is 0.1 at 3.1% in the general population. Higher in males, symptoms in patients with Wolf-Parkinson-White include palpitations, presyncope and syncope, and can even include sudden cardiac death. This syndrome accounts for upwards of approximately 1% of sudden cardiac death in athletes. This population is at risk for supraventricular tachycardia due to the presence of this accessory conduction pathway. And the characteristic ECG findings that we'll review include three main factors. The presence of a short PR interval, a delta wave, which is a slurring of the P wave into the QRS, and a widening of the QRS complex. It's also important to note that wolf parkinson white can be associated with specific congenital heart lesions, which is why one of the important diagnostic workups in the syndrome is an echocardiogram. Three high-yield CHD lesions that are known to be associated with the Wolf-Parkinson-White are Epstein anomaly, which is an abnormal development of the tricuspid valve, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and L transposition of the great arteries, also known as congenitally corrected transposition, or ventricular inversion. In Wolf-Parkinson-White, intermittent pre-excitation on ECG or loss of pre-excitation in a single beat on exercise stress testing is associated with the presence of a low-risk accessory pathway and thereby a low risk of ventricular arrhythmias, which is why, along with echocardiograms, ECGs, Holter testing, and exercise stress testing become important as diagnostic workups. From the standpoint of evaluation of patients either with diagnosed or suspicion for Wolf Parkinson White, a very thorough personal history and family history, as well as physical exam, also becomes very important alongside diagnostic imaging and ECG workup. Treatments commonly are beta blockade for symptomatic patients, activity restriction in certain population, i.e. those with concern for high-risk pathways, and electrophysiologic studies with potential ablation of accessory pathways. As you can see here, I have provided a characteristic EKG of patients with Wolf-Parkinson-White. And you can see the three things that are commonly seen in patients with Wolf-Parkinson-White. First and foremost, you'll see here a short PR interval. As you can see, unlike normal EKGs, where you generally tend to have a P wave followed by a return of baseline, and then the QRS complex, this P wave blends right into the QRS. Secondly, that delta wave that in this EKG can be seen in the precordial leads and in lead one in particular, you can see that that P wave slurs into the QRS complex. And then lastly, the widened QRS, which in general does vary depending on the age and size of the patient with normative values already present in the literature and in adolescents and adults would be greater than 120 milliseconds. Preoperative considerations in patients presenting for surgeries who have Wolf-Parkinson-White, if they are already on antiarrhythmic treatment, 
consider continuing those preoperatively, unless the patient is presenting for EP study, in which case it may behoove to not continue those antiarrhythmics because the goal of the study would be to elicit the abnormal rhythm to identify and map it for ablation purposes. Anticipate using agents that don't result in stimulation of the sympathetic system, which we'll discuss more as far as why in the next slide. Confirm the ECG, Holcher, and ECHO data in patients with wolf Parkinson white preoperatively, i.e. to identify whether or not there are associated underlying congenital heart defects that require the clearance and presence of cardiovascular anesthesiology. And also to consider cardiology and cardiovascular anesthesiology consultation to determine a safe anesthetic management plan in this population. Intraoperative considerations. Consider adequate induction doses of anesthetic medications to suppress the sympathetic response of laryngoscopy. High sympathetic tone in this population can effectively increase the ability for that accessory pathway to conduct at faster rates, which can thereby also increase the risk of life-threatening arrhythmias. So the suppression of that high sympathetic tone during laryngoscopy can become very important. Propofol can be considered appropriate for use as an anesthetic agent in Wolf Parkinson White for both EP study and non-EP study procedures. Volatile anesthetics can interfere with cardiac conduction properties. If to be used, isoflurane is preferential as it can prolong the accessory pathway refractory period, thereby decreasing tachycardia risk. Nitrous oxide has not been reported to have adverse events in this population. Fentanyl and remifentanyl can be used safely, but can interfere with conduction properties, while sufentanyl has less conduction interference. Atomidate is known to have cardiovascular stability in patients with WPW. Ketamine, on the other hand, consider avoiding that medication due to its sympathomimetic effects. Both depolarizing and non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers have been used safely in Wolf Parkinson White. However, one must be wary with reversal of these non-neuromuscular blockades with neostigmine, atropine, or glycopyrrolate, as they can result in tachyarrhythmias due to depression of the AV node and facilitating accessory pathway conduction. Sugamidex can be considered as a reversal alternative when neuromuscular blockade is used. Monitor intraoperatively also for tachyarrhythmias and considering things like having pads available as well as adenosine, Considering the use of short-acting esmolol may be beneficial if a patient is high risk for triggered SVT, and being watchful for the presence of irregular wide complex tachycardia in this population is important, and we'll discuss that shortly. Post-operative considerations include minimizing sympathetic stimulation with emergence with an airway, and considering deep extubation in this population, monitoring for arrhythmias in the early post-operative period, and considering observation with telemetry in Wolf Parkinson White patients postoperatively. As we had discussed briefly, monitoring for a regular wide complex tachycardia is important in Wolf Parkinson White, as it could be a finding consistent with pre excited atrial fibrillation. If a patient has an accessory pathway that is able to conduct rapidly, that would place this patient at risk for a life threatening ventricular arrhythmia. If that patient also has atrial fibrillation that is conducting down that accessory pathway, the presence of its conduction down an accessory pathway instead of the AV node will result in a wide QRS. The presence of it being atrial fibrillation that is conducting down the accessory pathway will result in an irregular pattern. And that combination will be seen here as an irregular wide complex tachycardia. As you can see on this EKG strip, if this were clear ventricular tachycardia, ventricular arrhythmias tend to be very consistent in their rates, like a metronome. And this wide complex tachycardia is not as consistent. Some QRS complexes have shorter R to R intervals than others. And this period, this area on the box, highlights that irregular wide complex tachycardia as a sign of pre-excited atrial fibrillation. This rhythm becomes important because use of AV nodal blocking agents is not indicated with this arrhythmia. The blocking down of the AV node could result in rapid one-to-one -one conduction 
of atrial fibrillation down the accessory pathway, resulting in life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias, i.e. ventricular fibrillation. Takeaway points for this brief discussion. Wolf Parkinson White is associated with the presence of a short PR interval, delta wave, and a widened QRS. The presence of this accessory conduction pathway allows for a reentrant supraventricular tachycardia, predisposing to cardiac symptoms and ventricular arrhythmias, and even sudden cardiac death. Patients with these findings that are consistent with Wolf Parkinson White warrant expert cardiology consultation, a diagnostic workup that includes echocardiogram exercise stress testing, and possibly intracardiac studies and ablation of accessory pathways, medical treatments, first line of therapy are beta blockade, and be watchful for the presence of irregular wide complex tachyarrhythmias in this population. Beta blockade, while used to prevent recurrent SVT in neonates and toddlers, is a to be adult recommendation only for those that refuse ablation or are not candidates for ablation. The concern is that the chronic AV nodal blockade from use of beta blockers could enhance accessory pathway conduction during an episode of atrial fibrillation. Additionally, as stated earlier in this talk, AV nodal blocking agents such as adenosine, calcium channel blockers, and beta blockers are absolutely contraindicated in patients with an irregular wide complex tachycardia due to the risk of developing life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. Thank you.